Right. And back to Tyree Cooper. Man T and Mike Doug. I can hear Mike Doug on his cigar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love Mike Doug. Oh, yeah, so Lenny. It's right. But I'll tell you my story. I can already hear me. He's going to be calling me after this. You know that, right? Oh, yeah. He, I don't he, know he, what Tyree telling you. Yeah, he, that's a story, he, but there's a real funny. story. And today is Mike Dunn's birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Mike Dunn. Yeah, yeah, today is his birthday. Man, so huh? everyone, everyone, everybody, Tyree, please send. Yeah, Ty, Mike Ty, Dunn. That's right. Yeah. Tell you that Tyree told you on True House Stories that it's Mike Dunn's birthday. Right, right. So, so anyway, so uh, as I was saying, so uh, Marshall was using more of a 707 than the 808. So we 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 said, look, the three of us, <clears throat> Hugo, Mike Dunn, and I, we said, look, man, all we have is $20. Can we borrow your drum machine for a week? He said, yeah, yeah, no problem. That's Marshall. No problem. Yeah, man. Yeah, no yeah. problem. You know how Marshall goes, yeah. So, so we had it for a week. So we, we started doing different productions and everything. So uh, again, I wanted to record like this one called um, the power plant thing, and it was more like uh, it was it was the precursor to your love, right? Um, so I wanted a record that was it was just more like a ah when I have it less than me I can't understand. It was the vocals from your love, but not Jamie Principal singing. It was uh. Adrian Jett, who sang it first, uh, who Jamie wrote it for, uh, I, I say, who Jamie wrote it for, she sang it, and that's the version that I liked. Right? It was the power plant thing. So I was like, I just like that. Ah, then the music came on. Pop, 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 pop. So I'm like, okay, how we, how we, how we make this happen? So all of us putting our, our two cents together, Mike and Hugo and myself, and so we creating this 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 beat and i'm like i got the perfect person to sing it let me ask my sister so i said i said chick i i just want you to i said i want you to write a song for me she's like okay like right because she really got me into the music to where i'm in and because she was in bands and things that next she was singing hell she even got me to sing at my first um my very first concert with her we sang uh Ronnie Laws and Debbie Laws song, uh, so special. All my life is all I have. Da da da, it's very special. Yeah, exactly. She so had me sing that. Oh, right, exactly. We did it. Yeah. So, so my sister was Great like, song. Yeah. "Great song, yeah. yeah, she could write a butt off and she could sing." So I'm like, "All right, chick, won't you sing? Won't you write the songs?" But the hook has to go. Ah, right. He said. She said, "Okay." She sang I Fit at Night. So we had it as a demo. We planned to fuck out this demo for about a good three, six months, five months. I wasn't even thinking about a record company at that point. I'm just thinking, like, who else is going to play this beside the three of us? So I took it down to Lil Lewis. Um, I took Ooh, it down to another brother. He, uh, but now, what's Lil Lewis doing this time? What's, what's his, his, input into what's going on and then you're going to him where where are you going to see him because he he was the i, I, I hate to say it, but he was doing a lot of hotel i wouldn't say the king of hotel parties but that's that's erroneous he had a own he had his own following and if you couldn't get down to ron hardy or you couldn't touch frankie knuckles uh little lewis was that dude you understand he he already been out long time Plan plan parties and things of that nature. So I, I figure if I take it down to Lil Lewis and he like it, he'll play it. Took it down to him. He kept my cassette, never gave it back to me. Yeah, I felt a certain way. I wanted to fuck him up. I, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to fight. But anyway, I, I said, I said, fuck it. Uh, I stopped dabbling with record companies, like going to. Again, I used to lie a lot, man. I said, you know, tell record companies I'm the hottest DJ since, you know, buttered toast and shit, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm on this station, I'm on that station, I'm doing that, and I'm just in my neighborhood. And there was no such thing as like someone going click, 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 you know, to Google it. 
They had to they had to live with whatever you told them right then and there. Peace. Another brother that's uh another brother that's in Thomas Spann. He was part of that, he was part of that uh that, that uh, them humble beginners, because uh we we shared a promoter name. Uh shout out to Marvin Terry. He 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 had a uh stutter, but he was his most famous stutter was when he introduced you to when he introduced you on the mic. He's a super bad brother from the south side of Chicago. Tyree Cooper, so everyone knows him from that, and it's not mocking him or mimicking him, but he said it was such a yeah. He said it was such a prominence that these are the words that you didn't forget. So peace out to shout out to uh, Thomas Spann. Anyway, shout out to my, my brother DJ Earth too. Anyway, uh, anyway, um, so we so I took it to Lil Lewis. He liked it, and so I'm like, okay. Did he ever play it? Yeah, he played it. He, he played. Okay, it. good. Um. So I'm thinking like, okay, I need to start looking at labels. So I started messing with Track Records because Track Records at this particular time was giving me free music. So I had all the colors. Because you were the baddest DJ in the land. Because I was the baddest DJ on the South Side. I was that dude. But to my credit, to my credit, I just didn't play the South Side. Uh, I'm well known with the, my Latino brothers as well. Because when the brothers, when my brother's brothers wasn't giving me no love, I went to my Latino brothers. And they, <laughs> and they took you in. Oh, gave- like a champ. That, like a champ they did. So uh, when, 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 um, when I started messing with Larry Sherman, he told me my records, uh, he told me, basically he said the records sucked. He said, I feel the night sucked. So everyone, Larry Sherman is the owner of Trax Records. Was the owner. I let him well, like the may, he, may he rest oh, in peace. Right. He was the owner. And he said that, I took him two records. I took him I Fit at Night and I took him these rhythm tracks. Oh, that oh, wait a me. minute. But Larry Sherman, did he really know what he was hearing? No. He, he knew. He did and did it. Because Rocky said some, Rocky didn't say it with, Rocky Jones from DJ and Ash didn't say it sucked. He just said that, um, when I took it to him, he played it 15 times. And the song was the song was half of a half of a, a 30 minute cassette. You feel so me? He played it over like so, five hours. So this right. So he sat and listened to this song 15 times, and the song was 15 minutes long, at least. So, right. So I had to sit there for some hours while he sit and listen to it, sit and listen to it, and sit listen and listen again. To it. And then he said, at the end of the day, he said, uh, it needs strings. I'm like, strings? What the fuck you? No, it don't. Well, <laughs> how, how about hooking up with Marshall Jefferson and then y'all can, you know, you can do some string arrangements. I'm hooking up. I'm like, I'll hook up my big brother because at the time, Marshall was looking for his drum machine now. So, right, because you want <laughs> money in the machine. No, no money. Move Your Body probably would have been made with an 808 because he had not made Move Your Body at that time. You feel me? So um, we had his drum machine for so long that... Uh, you did the lease agreement. which was Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. But hey, Lenny, man, I know the people going to hate me. Can you go to another commercial? I, I got to do something really, 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 really fast. So you got to cut me off the screen. I'll be back in two minutes. Yeah, we'll, we'll give really you. That's important. all right. That's all right. We'll give you another commercial. Go do your thing. All go right, ahead. Go ahead. That's, that's all right. Once again, because my man's got to jump out for a second and the interview is that intense, please sign up for the newsletter. One more time, please. I said, please sign up for truehousestories.com and newsletter. When you do sign up, okay, you're going to get a email and that email is to verify that you did sign up. Please make sure you click on and give it the okay so we can have you there. While I have all of you in attention, we're doing a special show next week with Oscar Reyes, yeah, sorry. Archie Burnett, Mikey Jones, a dancer in paradise. We're going to show pictures from the garage dance floor and all that stuff. So please tune in next week as well. Same time, seven o'clock UK time. Okay, back to Tyree. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, 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 um, Marshall, I went over to Marshall's house. Everybody, hang on. 
He's got the drum machine for a while now. He didn't say oh, how he long. He had that motherfucker for six months. Woo! About a twenty dollar drop off. A oh, one time twenty dollar drop off. That's right. Peace, shout out to my boy Aaron. Uh, so let's make twenty dollars a month. He went on a six month program, so that's not like one twenty five a month. He paid. He paid him. He didn't say he's gonna say how long he had a drum machine. <laughs> it was that one. We just said we want to use it for a week. He said, "Yeah, twenty dollars. It, it twenty for twenty dollars. So, um, yeah, that's a great deal, bro. You didn't have to spend eight, seven, eight hundred dollars at the time to get whatever the machine was back then, six hundred, six thousand. That whatever it was back then, thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah. You didn't have to pay that, that money. You paid him twenty dollars. You had it for six months. What a great deal you had. Ooh, great deal. So, 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 I, so, Marshall said, "Hey, man, when you come over, bring my drum machine." So, all right, fine, Fred Dukes. I bring his drum machine. He said, okay, let's work on some strings. <laughs> uh, we hook everything up. My sister wasn't there, but the beats were still in the machine. So he said, uh, okay, I don't hear no strings for this, Tyree. I'm like, well, Rocky Jones said we got to have strings. He was like, man, man, fuck that. How, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this record? And he's playing me Taste My Love. He's playing me uh, the original video crash that he did with Kim Mazel singing on it. Wow, you're hearing the inside stuff. So, again, I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. I take it, I take it, I take it. And, you know, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't at this particular time ask him to do any remixes because I didn't know what, what, that, what that entailed anyway. But at the same time, he gave me a copy of... Uh, uh, Kim Mazel, uh, uh, Taste My Love. Uh, he wasn't, he wasn't going to give me uh, the video crash because he wasn't done with it, but I did hear it with Kim Mazel because the break part had the do, 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 do. it had all that shit to be at the, at, the be, at the break part. And uh, Kim Mazel was singing after that and before that, right? So anyway, we're working on it. He couldn't come up with any strings. Went back to DJ International and Rocky was like, uh, Rocky Jones was like, I guess he said, fuck it. Let's just record this motherfucker. He said, do you know how to play any instruments? I'm like, yeah, I can play a concert flute, a saxophone, a trumpet, a uh, 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 clarinet. And none of that shit was in the studio. So, you know. <laughs> You're looking around. You're pulling yeah. instruments in the air. I can yeah. play the marimba, xylophone. Yeah, yeah, right. none, of, none, of, none of them motherfuckers in the I air. Play because the I, guitar. Play the I could play bassoon. The sixth part of the orchestra section, the back. I part. could never play, but the clarinet, I got down. The saxophone, I got down. Uh, uh, the it's trumpet, the little bit, the trumpet. On the armature, right in the little, in the in the mouth. Yeah, I know. And the, the, the woodland, and that you got. And the trumpet is. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. It, but, I, but I played these instruments in high school, right? Anyway, so he said, "Do you not play?" I said, "Yeah, no, nah, I don't." So I put some sound effects on it, and then. Uh, Asked my sister, my sister started singing. So Rocky said he's gonna do the mix. I'm saying to myself, like, nah, I, I I gotta do the mix because it's my track and I know where the breaks are gonna come. I know where she's gonna come in. So he was trying to play the producer uh and fucked up the mix and then blamed it on me. <laughs> Typical, right? Fuck it all up. And call I mean, you. It all, like, hey man, the beats are off measure. This is that, it's that. I'm like, I had to take the brunt of it. So I said, you know what? No, we ain't finna do this no more. I'm gonna learn how to do this shit. So that was the beginning of my recording career and learning what the studio was about. And what 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 uh beginning of what the studio was about. So my first remix was done with with um my friend uh Professor Funk. I'm not for sure how many house heads remember him. He made this record uh uh, work your body rap, right? Um, and he did his other record called Visions. Yeah, I remember. Well, Visions, that was my first time ever doing a remix on a record. He gave me a shot because of the DJ, because the captain DJ I was on the streets, he used to come to the party, so forth and so on. So he gave me a shot. The remix did our, the remix is okay, but I still needed some time to learn. So I, I, I came up with another project called The House Family and I asked Joe Smooth to, uh, kind of give me some guidance because I, I like, I used to go to Joe, I went to a couple of Joe Smooth parties back in the day at the loft and he was a real smooth DJ. He was 
trans his transitions were smooth. So, and I didn't know the brother played keyboards like that. So he helped me and he kind of showed me, kind of guided me like this, that, and the third, you know, it yeah, goes like this and this. So I'm like, okay. So I, I took it in one ear and it should ran out the other, but I did practice. And uh, once I did the house family, the record sucked, but I feel the night people were still playing that motherfucker. They wanted me to make another I feel the night for whatever reason. I'm like, nah, man, you got to progress. Anyway, um, that was the beginning of my, my, my musical career. I mean, there was other records. Mike Dunn and my sister and I did a record called Feel the Heat that was never released. Um, um, I did a record within that time with Fast Daddy and my sister called The Wop, uh, which was a parody. It's supposed to have been a parody to uh, Can't Stop the House, but, uh, you know, people was getting inside themselves and started to think we was on some serious, trying to take somebody's records. And we was just, Eddie, Fast Eddie was on the radio. Uh, I was on the street, so it was just a funny record to make because he and I was supposed to have did uh, 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 Bad Luck Over. That was back in 85, in 85, 86. We were supposed to, be, we were supposed to be do Bad Luck. And uh, and we wind up doing uh, a whole group of other shit. <laughs> we wind up doing a whole group of other shit. Uh, uh, he did. He, he we did uh, the WAP. We did. He did um, this other record called uh, "Pump It Up," right? And when it was his time to come out with his record, he said he was going down to DJ National, and he took this record called "Pump It Up." I'm like, all right, cool, and it just went pump it. Pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it up, pump it. So I'm like, okay. So he said he, he Rocky Jones didn't like the record. He didn't like the record. So he went to Kenny Jason. Kenny Jason made him change it to Can You Dance? Ooh. So from that moment on, so I'm like, Eddie got a record out. I got a record out. So now we both famous. Eddie was already, Fast Eddie was already up here because he was the DJ Fast Eddie on the radio. So I'm looking like, okay, now both of us are famous. Now let's do a record together. Uh, and again, we 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 came up with this track. Uh, uh, hey, oh, peace to my brother Gershon Jackson. Shout out to my brother Gershon Jackson. Uh, so me, a lot of people tuning in today for you, brother. But, that's, but, see, Gershon, but see, Gershon Gershon Jackson, we've known each other from playing ball and from Mike Dunn. That's another brother that he could rap. Anyway, 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 back to my story because that's a hip hop story. Anyway, uh, uh, Eddie and I, we, we was making fun of uh, uh, H-O-U-S-E. I pledge allegiance to the house fans because we're the fans. We was like, the big dance out the time was called The Wop, where you, you, know, you get your head like this, the, right, The Wop. So we made a parody uh, to that. And he played on the radio, I played on the streets. So Thompson Lenore got, got offended. So he's like, fuck it, we'll release it. So we went to DJ International and released it. So yeah, that's history. So that was the kind of the be early beginnings of my music career. Um, and then um, I wasn't getting paid from DJ International, kind of realizing that shit at the end of the day. Records was being sold. Excuse me. Records were being sold, but wasn't no money crossing my hands. And when I asked for money, I got the... Uh, I call it the Ralph Cramden story. I got the hum, 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 the I, I, I think he paid, I, I got enough to buy a card that didn't last. I had enough to buy a four track that did not last. So we took all of a thousand dollars for a song that sold 17,000, 20,000, maybe more. How many more than that, dude, in those days? Way more. more than that. Well, I mean, look, I didn't know it sold that much until I heard this guy, this, this record label. Uh, uh, what's the name of the record? I can't think of the name of the label, but it was distributed by Vista. He sampled, it's called I Feel It, but he took I Fear the Night. Also, it was on Ruby Red Records out of the UK from uh, Jim Masters. I think that was Jim Masters' label or something to that effect. Um, 
I, I figured the record was doing well because if it was sampled and it was licensed, you don't sample some shit that was garbage. You sample some shit that was hot back in the day. Damn right. Uh, so I figured it, uh, it sold. Last time I looked at the statements back in the day, it said 17000 Again, it might have been more, but I didn't get no $17,000 worth of money. I said it sold more. So I said, fuck it, I need a job. So I, I'm going to learn this business. So I asked um, uh, uh, Benji Espinoza. Oh, may he rest in peace. Yeah. I uh, asked Benji uh, Espinoza if I could work for him. So he said, yeah. $3.35 an hour. I just made I Fear the Night. I'm still a DJ on the South Side, but at the same time, I'm making $3.35 an hour working at Quantum Distribution. But I never trade that for the world because Benji was my mentor. He taught me the business. I mean, from A to friggin' Z. How to, you know, from the time I was making it to the time to even how to make the record to adapt to the people that's, that you're selling it to. Because this whole thing used to tell me, I said, man, Benji, nobody on the South Side gonna play this bullshit. This is some old, this is some old whack-ass shit the motherfuckers will play on fucking Rush Street or fucking everywhere. This ain't the shit the brothers gonna play. He say, he say, Tyree, it ain't all about the brothers, man. What about the Latino brothers? What about, I'm like, man, who the fuck listen to this? Who the fuck <laughs> <laughs> so, but with that said, with that said, uh, after I feel the night and um, after my first three records, I feel the night, house family and the walk, my music production started changing because I, I started listening to them and, and paying attention. So uh, everything started changing. So um, I started catering to different audience, not just the brothers. Uh, and then, and, and then still getting $3.35. But I can understand why you felt like that. And I'll tell you why. Because I remember all of us felt the same way. You had a black crowd love your music. You knew your music was the bomb. And I felt the same way when I DJed in New York and played and made those records. I could give a crap what my white friends were saying. I wanted the black crowd to love what I was doing. Right. Because they were the ones that are going to tell you how really good you were. And that's exact. That's what, because if you, you if see, because I got to understand that people, that wasn't until we came to Europe. It right. was like, I had, my whole crowd was black and Latin. That's More right. black than Latin, to be honest. Yeah, and I love know, because, music. Yeah, because, especially up in New York, up in the city, if you were DJing in the Damn city. Damn right. Girls, uh, yeah, you, I don't but, want no white crowd. You know why? Because I play commercial. I don't want to play no commercial music. Right. Right. So, even That's with that bid, with three dollars and thirty-five cent, three dollars and thirty. I have to keep stressing that. I have to keep stressing Bring that. Up, everyone, listen, three thirty-five. Three thirty-five. They making fifteen dollars an hour now. I was three thirty-five, and he told me how to sell records, what the uh, uh, price per disc, uh, the whole nine. So, with that said, working at DJ International, a uh, quantum distributor, distributors who was a division of DJ International. He said, you know what, Tyree, man, you ought to, uh, you ought to talk to Rocky and, uh, you know, you, you, you started, you got to make some beats, man. Make some beats for some of the records he, he, he's doing. I'm like, make some beats. What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, you know how to work a drum machine, don't you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. It's easy. Because I ain't got better at the drum machine now. I mean, I'm, I'm a master at this motherfucker. 909, 808, 707. I don't give a fuck which one you put in front of me. You got to give me my love because I know what I'm doing. So he's like, hey man, you used to talk to Rocky. At least, at least get fifty dollars a track, right? At least fifty dollars. So I'm like fifty. So we talking about 87. I'm like fifty. So if I did four tracks, that's two hundred dollars. If I, you know, I'm starting to add this shit up because all I gotta do is make the make the uh, the drums fit the song. How difficult? Again, this to me, this is like music class. How the fuck can you fail? It's like it's like DJ mixing. Oh, because you knew the formula. Bingo. So I go in the studio. There's Joe Smooth and there's Pete Black. And then there's oh, Rocky Jones. How far I go, Pete, Pete, Peter Black. That's a bad mother. That's my drums on that song. Those are my drums on that song. Bad mother. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's out of your Uh 
uh, uh, yeah. Though, so, so my point is, so we we're in the studio, and Rocky was trying to, I imagine, trying to put together some kind of production team like Motown, and I didn't know Motown had something to that degree. So, uh, anything that you heard from DJ International from 1986, 87, and a little bit of 88, it was uh, I call us the Funk Brothers. I, I, I was on the drums. Uh, Joe was on the arrangement and keyboards. Pete Black was on the keyboards. And um, this was Rocky's quote-unquote production team. So we'd be in the studio from 6 in the evening when I got off work to 6 in the morning. And I still had to go to work at Quantum Distribution. Right, for $3.35 an hour. But at this time, I'm saying, hey, I get $50 because we did four songs. We did three songs. So I'm getting... I'm getting an extra hundred dollars because my rent was only four hundred dollars at the time. So I'm looking at how I'm paying my rent through the music. Needless to say, it was the beginning of some shit that I had no idea was going to happen. Uh, as many songs as I did, I got a third of the money. So if I did four songs, I only got fifty dollars. He always had it down to the fifty dollar mark, didn't he? If I did, if we did six songs, yeah, fifty dollars. I got fifty dollars, and I'm like, "Yo, what the rest of the money?" Yeah, what was the answer to that? I want to hear that one. He 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 laughed. Go, huh, well, he, he, well, uh, 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 well, Lorna, 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 cut you a check, and she go, "Hey, babe, um, Rocky didn't tell me that, so I had to go to back and the forth and the back and the forth until one time I was like, you know what? <laughs> Fuck it, I'm not gonna do it no more. Right. Um, um, so the. I started concentrating more on what was going on in the streets, right? Like the acid sound, uh, that was pretty big, the whole acid house scene. And again, we, another, just to backtrack, when Ted bought us, uh, when Ted got us the drum machine so we can practice or make our own tracks, he bought a 303, but we didn't know it was a 303. He bought this machine and all it made was ring, 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 ring. Man, he was like, the fuck is, man, what did, what did, we need the beats, homie, where the beats at? <laughs> so he took it back and got the 606 drum ticks, and we was how happy. How could you bring us this thing? This is useless. Garbage. Meanwhile, how many records were made with a 303? Meanwhile, Pierre had the same motherfucking box, and he went, wah, 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 like, the fuck is this? What the? Yo, the is that 303? Is, is that, th what? <laughs> Yep. And me and Mike looked at each other and was like, hell no, we gave that motherfucker back. And you <laughs> couldn't find it no more after that, bro. We gave that motherfucker back. So anyway, uh, I started doing more of that and, and went back to like hanging out with Mike and, and things of this nature because it was a little bit more freedom uh, hanging out with your friends. And and at this time, particular time, he he was living with, uh, uh, he, he was staying with Bam Bam. Um, and you know, he was doing give it, it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, right? And so, you know, he Mac and I collaborated on a couple, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he helped me, he helped me, uh, he kind of taught me in a in a expedited way how to use a 303. But the person that really taught me how to use a 303, because I'm missing a whole segment, yes, uh, Liddell, Liddell Townsend has to get some love from me, uh, because this brother showed me how to play a keyboard and how to program it through a 909, how to trigger through a 909. And uh, how to make how to, how to make bass lines. How to make the bass lines I could hear in my head. Uh, I gotta get a, little bit, a lot of love because that helped me with DJ International too. Uh, it showed me how to you know, really program the drum machine and uh, Victor Romeo, he, I, I gotta give a shout out to my brother Victor Romeo. Love, love will find a way. Yeah, I, I, I just tell him your names, I'm got, I, can see, I can hear the records coming uh, in. Oh, yeah, because we all collaborated on different type of tracks. Like Nunu, Liddell Towns, or Nunu. I mean, that's way before. You're talking way before Nunu, but yeah, but Liddell also did. He also played on um from Chippy. He, he did uh like this, like like like, like this, like, like like oh he, my god. He's a musician on like this. Uh, the musician on who was yeah, the singer? Do you remember the girl who sang on that record? The uh, K, K Joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Woo, fabulous yeah. voice. Um. Uh, but I gotta get Liddell, Liddell and uh, Chubby. But 
the world know him as uh, William S. You know, uh, uh, somewhere in West Hell. Hell, we for even right. even during the time of me being in the studio with Rocky and being a part of Front Brothers. Now wait a minute, T. Let me ask this question: Was there a thing called a contract that you guys signed? I'm just curious while this is all going on. With Rocky, because everybody's always asked that question. Was there ever any paper, not tissue paper, to wipe you behind or blow? I'm talking real paper to sign something. Yeah, 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 for sure. There was paperwork. What but kind of had, paperwork? But you, but you had to, you know, you, you got to be able to peruse what's being put in front of you so you can uh, understand what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. Because, like, like, for me, for me, my first contract was only two years long. Right, with no extra years. So when my contract was up, they had six months to renew it. And within them six months, <laughs> well, no, honey, no honey, no money, no yeah. honey. So, you know, within them six months, I got it in. Uh, 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 I did some records, unofficial records for track, <laughs> for track records, unofficially. Fire Liddell and uh, William S. Uh, under the, the pseudo name, or did you do under your name? What was the other? Uh, it, it was uh, it, it was the artist, but we did it on this label called uh, House Time Records. Oh, if you ever God. pick up some House Time Records, wasn't that many House Time Records? Uh, it wasn't that many House Time Records uh, uh, released. Maybe three or four. We did uh, a version of Love and Happiness, <clears throat> Love and Happiness from. Um, it was another uh, piece of my way, Rich. Uh, another uh, Marshall Jefferson track that never got the light of day. Uh, we redid, we remade that. We remade uh, Peace Pipe uh, from uh, BT Express. And um, <laughs> Dale on the drums. But see, now here's the thing I'm going to ask you those records are, for what they are, incredible right. masterpieces. Right. So, when you guys sat down to start making these songs, what was the thought? We just want to make something that sounds close to it because to redo those band things, they don't sound the same. Chicago House does not sound like those disco style records. No, but it. But for us, these were the records that were being played. Like, 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 like I said, like Love and Happiness, right? That wasn't even a fucking record. That was based on a cassette tape from Marshall that he gave to Ron Hardy. You know what I'm saying? This Peace Pipe was something that we would play, we had played a few years ago that was still kind of relatively hot on the circuit. So 87, we we basing it on 1985 material. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, was, I'm, I'm, missing, I'm missing one. The kind of large. <laughs> I got a big, I got a big, no, you kind of large was uh was uh was another record made by somebody in the streets that we just said fuck it we gonna make it our own. That's right, we're gonna take it, make it ourselves, right? We're gonna take the idea and run with yeah. it. So uh, none of our names is on it. Like I say, it's uh, shout out to Liddell and William S. These were my, these are my brothers still to this day. We uh we uh we uh we helped each other out. So when it came time for me to return a f- favor, to like to do acid over. Now, can you imagine uh, Liddell being a part of Acid Over, one of my most famous tracks? Rocky said, no, if you're not signed to DJ International, uh, then it, it doesn't work. It, it's not going to work for him. Because on the original box, it said... But see, I don't understand something. If these guys are running a professional record label, why would they do two-year contract? Uh, well, because if you're on some snake shit, <laughs> not for sure... Then yeah, you're gonna try to be the least uh, to do the least. Uh, but for me, the no, actually the first one I feel the night was uh yeah, first our first one I did was uh was two years. Right. Um, and then the next one after that, a little bit before I did turn up the bass, that was a three-year, and that was the last contract that I signed with DJ International. So only I only had two contracts with DJ. I don't blame you. It's better to say, but you did a lot of beats to them too. <laughs> How many beats would you say you did that re- were released? A whole year's worth. And how many is that? Like 60, uh, 70? 
at least that two compilations or years worth of artists coming down that had little to next to no idea. I ain't gonna say no idea. So Terry, no you idea. telling me every record coming out had your signature beats on it. And that's nowhere to be seen, people. No, because like, like, but, but no, go in the studio. Just go hook these people up. Also, you didn't see Joe Smooth and Pete Black name on the record either. You just saw produced by Rocky Jones. You feel me? Because Joe and Pete this Black. This is the beginning of ghost production before <laughs> ghosting was even ghost. Before it was even ghost. I had no idea what I was, again. I, me, Hugo and I, Hugo Hutchinson, Hugo H, we, we were roommates. All I was trying to do is get my part of the rent up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to get my rent up. Keep, keep, girl, keep, keep the lights on, right? Man, really, literally trying to keep the lights on. But by me not getting paid, I was like, all right, fuck it. So I I, uh, 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 I took my talents elsewhere. Um, uh, One of the first places was... uh was like I say, un un unofficially was Larry Sherman. So when Larry Sherman paid uh, Liddell and and uh, Chubby, William S. I, I, William S. I ain't gonna call him Chubby. It's all right. That's the names of the street. We have to yeah. know the name. Uh, when he paid them, they would break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. So if he, so if Larry gave, so if Larry gave him a thousand, we all split three hundred apiece. You know right. what I'm saying? Who got the hundred dollars? Who got the hundred dollar commission? We ate. You know what I'm saying? We ate. <laughs> so, yo, it's going to go like this. Let's go eat. We split the 900. We got the $100 to eat. That's it. We, we went to go eat. Steak. Go have a steak tonight. It's the last time we're going to eat. Till next time we do a record. Oh, my um, God. Uh, and then when Rocky would try to find out about it, he, you know, he tried to do little threats. I'm like, I'm not even signed to DJ. What kind of threats were they trying to do? What were they trying hey, to tell hey, you? Hey, Tyree, man, you know you... Uh, 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 Tyree, you know you can't... Uh, 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 be recording for anybody else. I'm like, I'm not signing DJ. <laughs> like, yeah, my contract was up. What? 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 Like, yeah, dude, my contract was up. <laughs> what? Yeah, talk to Lauren. His sister's name was Lauren. Talk to Lauren, my contract was up. And there was no automatic back then, automatic extension. Nah, nah. So Thank God. Could you imagine if he would have had, had your name for that word purple to it? Hey. <laughs> Oh, you be singing perpetual nothing right man, now. Yeah, I mean, that word, man. And thank goodness. Yo, it sounds like the Cadillac record story. Outside your Chevy. Not your Cadillac. Go get your Chevrolet. Yeah, that Meanwhile, was they made a million dollars and they got you got your little six little shimmer on Chevrolet. And it's funny you mentioned that because um I didn't even know those stories were existed in the music industry. I was still I was still under the assumption that. If you made a record, you were famous, you got paid, and you were rich. Then think about motherfuckers getting ripped off. Like, oh shit. Like uh Ray Charles was rich to me. He was rich. Didn't understand how he got he, he they were trying to rip him off. Uh what was um anybody on Motown was rich. Didn't understand how they was getting ripped off. You know what I'm saying? To that degree. So when it was when uh 87 came, uh the first in the 80s. 87 came. Again, this is all, and I'm only three years into DJing, mind you. Two years into production. But I'm making all these music in that time. Because I'm learning, I'm consistently learning. As people say, now that they say, um, uh, I'm in the lab. The lab for me was everywhere because I never owned a piece of equipment. So if you had equipment, I was generally at your spot or in the studio doing what I do. So in 87, um, Europe was starting to come to more to Chicago. So um, what's his man named? Damon DeCruz from Jack Track Records, right? They started coming to Chicago and they were picking up material. Uh, I'm going to say this briefly. I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, no one gave me the info of where this guy was, but people was picking up checks from this guy. Only person that gave me the information was uh, uh, K. Alexi, because he said to me, he said, hey, man, you ain't you ain't you're not down there getting that money. I'm like, what money? Motherfucker. Here. 
gave me the address, went down there, and I took the guy, Damon the Cruz, I took him video crash, my version, or as y'all in New York would call it, acid crash. That's right. That's what right. I remember, acid crash. Right. So the original was called video crash. And I took it to him, and I quote, he said, this is the worst piece of shit that you <laughs> can ever bring me. You got to say it with the English accent then. Mate, mate, this is, this is rubbish, mate. This is rubbish. You have, any, have anything shite, else? Mate. This is a bit shy. He said, you have anything else? I'm like, no, nah, mate, I, nothing I can do. For, I'm like, for real? He's like, mate, this is rubbish. Okay. Let's say he came down in, in May. By September. Let's go on. September comes. Now what happens? I release it with Rockin' House Records. By December, this the sounds the crook Jeffrey Collins, the motherfucker, bootlegs <laughs> it and changed the name from Video Crash to Acid Crash. Right? I'm going okay. Didn't think none of it. Again, somebody else I want to hear. You may, throughout my story, you may you may seem like you may hear me say I want to beat somebody up all the time. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I wanted to fuck Discru him. You felt disgruntled by that point. You were, you were angry. You were vexed. You, he, had a v, he had a V on his head. Ooh, he had a target on his motherfucking back. <laughs> Candy J, uh, uh, shout out to Candy J, who really helped me develop uh, how to perform live on stage. She knew him personally and he, she, 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 um, she uh, called him up when I was on the telephone and she wouldn't tell me if he was at a if, if he was at her house or not. So I'm like, fuck, do I take this chance to go over there? Or do I, you know, just sit? So I, I just laid and it's like, okay, you get the pass today, bro. Cause and she said, Yeah, he's at my house. I probably would have caught a case in Chicago. But needless to say, I left the record alone. And from that, the music industry was changing again. So now my record acid over that I wasn't getting paid for because Rocky said because Rocky said um, Rocky said that this record was uh, uh, a piece of shit no sorry he, he said he, Rocky wasn't paying me and uh, acid over was not selling is what he told me Derek May comes back to uh, to Chicago and say hey man what's this record you got that everybody it's going crazy over. I'm like, what? I fit the night? The what? No, He's like, no. He said, this is acid record. Everybody's playing it in Europe. Everybody's playing in London. I'm like, what record you talking about, Derek? What the fuck? Acid over. Acid over. Rocky said that record wasn't selling. So, Rocky, <laughs> hey, man, uh, you told me that record wasn't selling. Oh, Tyree, <laughs> a, 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 a few DJs, a few DJs, uh, uh, our planet, but that doesn't mean it's selling. So that record goes away, enters Fast Eddie again. Eddie comes down. Uh, Rocky's trying to get Fast Eddie to make some more records. Eddie is done. When I say Fast Eddie said he was done, he was done with the music industry. He wanted nothing else to do with house music. I put it like that house music, hip hop. He was all into. He was always Ed, fast. Eddie could always scratch. If you have you heard of Jeff, have you heard Jazzy Jeff scratch before? I have. Yes. That's how fast Eddie scratched to me. He was in that same line as Jazzy Jeff. This rhythmic pattern, mm -hmm. this very soulful kind of scratching. But Eddie was like, "Fuck that, fuck house. I'm not doing that shit anymore." <laughs> I'm done. I am done. D he, got, he, got, he got screwed over too by Rocky, right? He got screwed over too because uh, Can You Dance was Fast Eddie's record, but Kenny Jason got the money. So because I said I said earlier, Can You Dance was was the original version of when Eddie gave me a concept was called Pump It Up. And it's the same thing. Pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it up. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you? dance, you know, the same record. So, he was done with the industry. He was into hip-hop. He said, I'm only making hip-hop. Rocky's like, we don't sell hip-hop. Well, I'm not making no house. Well, what you gonna do here? I'm just paraphrasing the conversation. I wasn't on the telephone. He said, well, fuck it. I'll rap over it. Okay. He come down. He did uh, uh, Acid Thunder first. 
he did this other record, Ain't It Funky, these 303 track kind of tracks. And then all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden, he he has this 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 rap. And I'm like, the fuck, who's that rapper? And he said, stop playing, motherfucker, that's me. I'm like, no, 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 seriously, who's that rapper? Yeah. He said, motherfucker, stop playing, that's me. When you start, dude, when you start rapping, now, Acid Over has a rap on it, but I necessarily wouldn't call that shit a rap. That's Pete Black wrote some text for me on uh, for Acid Over because Rocky wanted some word, some words on it. All right, whatever. Eddie was, it's time to get funky to this cut. So scream and throw your hands up. The party's about to begin. I'm like, oh, fuck, this is the shit. When that record came out, that was the game changer, right? Yo-Yo Get Funky was the game changer. Then Rocky say, hey, Tyree, you know, you should do something similar. That's Eddie's thing. I'm a deep house guy. I'm not going to do that. Benji, on the other hand, said, hey, man, look, give it a try. You never know. So I'm like, okay, he was kind of right and wrong about making the beats. Cause I still, I'm, I'm still uh, not getting paid. I even did, I even did a ghostwriting for Candy J for one of her biggest records. Uh, is my drums on it, right? Uh, 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 so, so uh, when he asked me to do it, I'm like, okay, okay. So I call Liddell. And I said, Liddell, what's uh, Cool Rock's number? Cause he he had uh, Cool Rock and I had met. Three years prior to that, we was in a DJ battle together. And he, we had met prior to that. So I said, what's Cool Rock number? Because by that time, Liddell had did a, a house rap with Cool Rock called uh, I'll Make You Dance. Right? And um, I was like, what's Cool Rock's number? He gave me Cool Rock number. I'm like, yo, uh, yo, peace. I, I, peace. Uh, yo, Cool Rock, before I get to the I key and the peace. I said, yo, Cool Rock, uh, would, you, would, would you do a record with me? Like, yeah, 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 you my man, you know, whatever, whatever. Just give, me, give me the track and let me hear it. I made the track, dropped it off at his house. He, the next day, he had the verses. He, he spit me, he spit it to me over the telephone. And I was like, yeah, it sounds good. I just like the one part, you know, like everyone else likes. Uh, so I was like, yeah, okay, it's fine. So we went down, DJ and asked him, recorded the song. Uh, asked Fast Daddy if he would do a mix. He kind of halfway said, yeah, but he didn't want to do the mix. He'll just scratch over it. So I was like, all right, fine. I'll do the mix. You scratch. I put your name on it. Henceforth, the Fast Daddy mix. Mm. So, right. Because I, I did, the uh, only mix I didn't do was a Julian Perez mix. But all the mixes on Turn Up the Bass is mine. I just put Eddie's name on it. But he did do the scratching. It was no big deal. For me, it was no big deal. It was over with. That was that. Didn't think nothing of it. Benji comes downstairs. This is probably your biggest record, Tyree, to date. Dude, what the fuck you talking about? Tyree, this record is, this is probably your biggest commercial record, he said. It's probably your biggest commercial record to date. What? Commercial? Up until that, I'm still Mr. Underground. I'm still South Side of Chicago. I'm still, still, still. Well, when the record came out, everybody was bugging. Everybody started playing it in Chicago. And then all of a sudden, uh, Pete Tong, <clears throat> Pete Tong is putting this on his first edition of Silver and Black compilation. I'm sorry, not Silver and Black, the Chicago, the house out of Chicago, where he had all these other songs with vocals on it and things of that nature. And he said the response he got from him was, was phenomenal. Okay, cool, whatever. I didn't think nothing of the song other than, you know, it was a nice song. Until, song. Until? Nice. The song came out, we did, the song came out in September. By December, I was on my way to, to London because the song was already that big. That was the fastest I had ever seen a song get that big. September came out, Chicago played it from September October, November. I guess New York played it within that time period as well. By December? Oh, no, even November, before my birthday. November, I'm already going to Europe for that song. We performing this song. 
because now he licensed it to Pete Tong. Pete Tong's an FFR, FFRR. And I didn't know who Pete Tong was, the significance in FFRR or London Records or Polygram. All that shit was new to me. So we get there. Uh, we get to London for the first, my first time in 1988. And the first night we hung out, Kurok and I, the first night, the very first night we hung out, we went down to this club in, in Soho called uh, The Wag. Right? And so that's where the guys uh, at Worldwide Talent Agency says, this is the hot spot. It's down in Chinatown, actually, not so down in Chinatown. He said, this is the hot spot. So we get there the first day we walk in, uh, we meet Boy George. First day. First day. I'm freaking the fuck out because to me, my sister was not only, my sister, my sister chick was a biggest Prince fan on the planet. You could not tell her shit about Prince that she did not know. Duran Duran. She was a Duran Duran fan. She was a George Michael Wham fan. Wow. She was a Culture Club and Boy George fan. This is my sister chick who sang out for the night. So when when he said, yeah, it's Boy George, I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, I'm 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 a kid. Like, yo, I loved I'll Tumble for You. That's one of my favorite songs. Like, yeah. I'll tumble for you. I tumble for you. Cool Rock, on the other hand, was like, yo, you did a song with my uh with my cousin. I said, well, who's your cousin? Africa Bambada. Yeah, well, yeah, but but uh we wasn't in the same studio. Fuck you not in the same studio and you doing a song with him. I said, mate, they flew the tape over. I recorded my bits on the tape and flew it back. Fuck out of here. He, so he's like, fuck out of here, man. Some old bullshit. I'm like, yo, cool rock, that's this boy, this boy George. He said, Hey man, what's your name? I went, Tyree. Tyree. As in Cooper, you mean the one that's saying, the one that made acid over? I'm like, hold up. I'm To me, acid over is me singing on my song, acid over. He's singing my part. I'm going, okay, light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, light bulb. Hey, Rocky, listen, man. <laughs> Back to Rocky again. Because I was signing DJ International. Right. Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's, uh. Let's let's do a remake, a remix of of Acid Over Boy George singing it. And I quote, he's done. He's over with. He's finished. Dude, this is Boy George. How is he finished? This is Boy George. He hasn't had a hit record out. I'm like, no. He had a record with Teddy Riley just seven months ago in 1988. This is 1988. He had just had a record with Teddy Riley. So he's not finished. Okay, but he's I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Boy George on a Tyree record on Acid Over. I'm like, this is the shit. So he didn't, he, he didn't buy it. He didn't, he didn't balk on it. So I'm like, okay, okay, whatever. And not thinking in the back of my mind, this dude is really fucking me over, right? Rocky Jones, the DJ International. So we do the tour. We went up and down the UK in spots that I've never heard of. Uh, we do the tour and we come back home. I'm doing another record, uh, Hardcore Hip House, right? Um, I, I always say it was a trade-off between Joe and I, but it really wasn't. We were just front brothers. Uh, Joe Smooth, I, I did I did drums for Joe Smooth's Promised Land. I'll put it like that, right? Uh, my bitch. Especially when it goes, doom, ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom. the Tom roll. That's part of it. But uh, Joe put that doom, 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 doom. He did that. But the other bitch that's in that motherfucker is all your boy. <laughs> we used to we listen to the breakdown. We listen to the breakdown of uh of uh Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's, there's I fear the night at the breakdown in the in, in uh in uh promised land. It breaks down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doom, 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 doom. Doom, 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 doom. That's no sample, that's me playing it. On top of the percussions I'm putting on top of it, and trying to emulate Marshall with that from Ten City, but Joe put that doom 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 doom. Um, he put that in there, so uh, I didn't mind. I, I didn't care about that part. I, I just like 
okay, I, I, I know my signature is going to be all over the song. Like Pete Black's record or any record on DJ International, when you go back and do the discography from 86 to 87, you got this just drum roll. This is my signature, right? This is my signature roll so let you know that I had something to do with it. So for that, I asked Joe Smooth, hey man, can you play some keyboards on Hardcore Hip House? He said, yeah, okay. Because at this time, Hardcore Hip House is a hip house record with acid. Nothing to do with deep, but I like deep music. I like the pianos and stuff. So he come up with this this three chord, this I'm like, okay. And he put the piano dun. And the way he did, the way he structured, I was like, oh, this is some cold shit right here. Hell yeah, Joe. And I, I felt vindicated because I thought, just me being as arrogant as I am, uh, that my beats on Promised Land helped propel that record, you know, to the, to the top. Not, nothing to do with Anthony Thomas, nothing to do with Joe Smooth. Song, nothing to do with the song, nothing. No, just me and my beats, right? So I'm thinking Joe's paying me back. So at this time, um, doing more hip house, more hip house, more hip house. And then uh, uh, Tony Humphreys come to do, a, to do a mix for Joe Smooth. Rocky paid Tony Humphreys to do a mix for Joe Smooth for a record called uh, I'll Be There, featuring uh, Michael Benson. I'll be your shelter in the pouring rain. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is Tony Humphreys' mix, but Rocky didn't put Tony Humphreys' name on it whatever. So uh, Tony and I, I'm meeting him for the first time because, you know, back in the day, he had put out these, on West End, put out these uh, mega, mega mix, this mega, mega mix. Uh, he put out his, somebody put out his mixtape on vinyl because it, it had, it was a Tony Humphrey mix and the, the uh, what is it? The, um, it wasn't a real break. It wasn't a real no, it's a constant mix. It, it was, was a constant mix, but, but how they how they how they did it was well, they gave you enough beats in the beginning to mix into it. So I'm 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 on I'm on I'm on I'm on that cloud with Tony Humphreys. He said, Hey man, uh can you do me a favor? Like, what, what, what's that? I said, first of all, I said, uh I said, How you you want to listen to your mix, Tony? He said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he got in my car, we went to uh we went to this club called Club the Ray. Uh, and uh, Tony sat in my car and was playing, I'll be there. I, I, yeah, I'll be there. My car had the sound system like you hear today. So when you played that motherfucker, it bumped. Boom, 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 boom. boom. You know, he, he was like, hey, hey, can you turn this down? I'm like, no, man, you, everybody got to hear this shit. I'm with Tony for the Humphreys. And, uh, uh, Joe Smith, uh, they call him Joe Smooth up in up in New Jersey, who worked at Moving Records. Joe Smith Joe was in the back of, was in the back of a Trans Am. His legs all bent up. He got this beat beating him on the side. <laughs> uh, 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 Joe uh, Smith's and, a pretty tall dude. I know that for a fact. He's a pretty tall guy. So we went and hung out at Club LeRae. So he because Tony was in town, he wanted to you know, see what Chicago nightlife was, so we went down to Club Blu-ray, uh, hung out there for a minute, so as we were coming back down towards DJ International before he went back to his hotel, he said, hey, can you, um, can you uh, spoon up uh, Hardcore Hip House? I'm like, you want to do a mix on a hip house record? He said, is the piano there too? I'm like, yeah. So I'm thinking he gonna make. I'm thinking I'm about to get a straight up Tony Humphreys exclusive remix for the vinyl. He said, "Nah, I just want it for myself so I can have a copy for myself to play." You know, <laughs> the original, right? No problem. It's, fuck, it's Tony Humphreys. What am I gonna say? No, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a no, no brainer. Right. So yeah, I spool, I spool it up. Uh, uh, I, I kind of engineered the session, so to speak, because there was no other engineer around. So I, I engineered it and everything. And he did a mix of Hardcore Hip House, his own version of his own edit. He said he edited it when he get back to Jersey, whatever, whatever. Okay, fine. Fuck it. I left it alone. 
in the mix in the midst of my second album working on it Tony Tony Humphrey calls DJ International asked to speak to me he said hey man listen you should put some vocals a female vocal singer on um hardcore hip house I'm like what the record is done it's over with it's a rap song right sure yeah he said nah I'm telling you man you should put some vocals on it 